Hi, this is Maroon Bixen, and I want to re-give the talk I presented at the North American Neuromodulation Society uh, in January, and I wanted to record a quick five-minute version of it. Um, so this talk was about technology and concepts for both cervical and auricular non-invasive vagus nerve stimulation, and these are my disclosures and you can look at my Twitter feed for both this and, and other updates about lack of activity. So the vagus nerve is a structure that is very interesting um, in many applications of neuromodulation or bioelectrical uh, medicine. And my overall point is that the vagus nerve goes to many structures. It goes to many places, both centrally and the periphery. And this is exactly why People are so excited about the vagus nerve as a potential target, but exactly for this reason, we need to be very nuanced um, about how we interface with the vagus nerve. And we need to move beyond what I've heard many surgeons call poke and hope. That basically means you stick an electrode near a target and you energize that electrode uh, and you hope that that will produce all the effects you want and none of the effects that you don't want. And rather, um, our approach has been to really focus on rational optimization of technology and trial design, and that's the approach I'll be summarizing very briefly now. We rely heavily in general on computational models of the head, and uh, our general idea is that you cannot model what you don't represent. So if you want to stimulate the cortex, you must model the cortex and the tissues around it in a lot of detail. If you want to model the vagus nerve, which is what is shown here, once again, uh, you need to represent the vagus nerve accurately as well as the tissues that are around it. And this was uh, um, one of our publications specifically addressing um, how to appropriately model cervical vagus nerve stimulation, so uh, the vagus nerve stimulation using electrodes on the neck. And the big takeaway from this is that how you do the models matter. The right level of details matter. So not complexity for its own sake, um, but models that are carefully rationalized to incorporate the right amount of detail. And that detail, as I'll discuss, needs to be represented at, at various scales. Uh, this shows the general modeling workflow with an MRI-derived model that's actually in my head. The electrodes are placed on the neck. This approximates um, a currently clinically used uh, non-invasive cervical vagus nerve stimulation device, uh, which produces current flow patterns through the neck. Some of that current will reach the vagus nerve, and then we can predict not simply whether the vagus nerve will be activated or not, but because the vagus nerve is made out of different axon types, which axon types will be activated. And there are two important takeaways from this. One is that you need to properly consider all the tissue that is between the electrode that's on the surface of neck all the way to the vagus nerve. And at a macroscopic level, the tissues that are around the vagus nerve. So as the vagus nerve travels through the neck, it's passing along bone, muscle, and other soft tissues, and its environment ends up being critical to properly predict how the vagus nerve will be activated. And we also discovered that the presence of, of, of soft tissue around the nerve, so this is a, a, a thick insulative sheet, can also profoundly affect um, the predictions of models and, and therefore the conclusions of, of what vagus nerve stimulation is activating. This briefly summarizes the, the, the results that are in the paper, starting with A, which is a simple model, which is a homogeneous model. So thinking of the skin as, as and the entire neck around the vagus nerve as one single blob of, of, of similar tissue. Going to a real tissue model, this includes that level of macroscopic detail I mentioned, bone and so on. And, and the obvious thing you see going from A to B is that this very smooth transition of, of electric field um, or electric field gradient along the nerve starts to become very jagged. Going from A to B, the line becomes very jagged. And that jaggedness represents the vagus nerve transversing different types of tissue. So for example, moving from a relatively conductive fat to a relatively resistive bone will cause a local spike in electric field around the vagus nerve as it travels through it. However, the presence of a sheath then dulls that effect. And I like to say that, you know, for a models to be useful, should, should, should um, a difference to be a difference must make a difference. What that means is that 
um, adding some level of detail to the model should qualitatively change the predictions of that model. And that's shown here, again, this is a, a figure directly from the paper. So very briefly, in the case of a simple model, um, we predicted that uh, C fibers would, would not be activated um, under any stimulus intensity. When we went to a real model, that prediction qualitatively changed, and it changed again when we added the sheaf. So again, adding this level of detail wasn't simply an academic exercise, uh, but was an attempt to, to generate models that will produce more meaningful predictions. And so again, going back to the overall hypothesis is that the vagus nerve is a very compelling target for all that it can do, but for exactly that reason, we need to be very careful about how we, we, we model it. And we've moved ahead from simply uh, not, not only considering um, cervical vagus nerve, but also auricular vagus nerve stimulation. These are some representative publications of that work. And here, once again, our work starts with computational models and not simply poke and hope and putting an electrode somewhere on the ear uh, and, and assuming that you're going to activate the cranial nerves that you're interested in and not the other cranial nerves that are in that vicinity as well, um, but rather thinking about how precisely we should place electrodes in and around the ear and the kind of waveforms we should apply to it in order to activate specific axons of a specific nerve. Um, and what this figure shows is the complexity of the cranial nerve circuits um, as they relate to higher brain regions, which ultimately are, are what we're interested in as far as affecting cognition and behavior we're activating. And when we're thinking, when we're thinking about the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, um, um, there's a nuance where there are two general pathways of, of potential neuromodulation. One that you could think of as an upstream effect where you're, you're stimulating the, the afferent vagus nerve uh, and that through the circuit I, I just illustrated uh, is then directly modulating the cortex leading to behavioral and cognition, cognition changes. But it's also possible by stimulating the vagus nerve, including the, the auricular branch of the vagus nerve, uh, to change physiological function. So these are the downstream effects, things like heart rate, heart rate variability, um, other parasympathetic functions and that in itself could change cognition and behavior because, because you're changing physiology and the two are obviously linked. And so a lot of our work is focused not just on technology optimization, uh, but as shown in this experiment, assessing both the physiological and cognitive effects of stimulation. Uh, this is one such experiment by, by Bashar Badran and colleagues where they considered both an active uh, and a control stimulation site and multiple frequencies and they showed that stimulation of the auricular branch of the vagus nerve could produce location and frequency specific changes in parasympathetic function. And this goes back to the idea of moving beyond poke and hope and really thinking about where we place the electrodes and the kind of waveforms we apply to them in order to activate specific neuronal targets in order to produce specific outcomes. Um, and in my lab, we have been um, expanding on these experiments um, you can see this subject also has an EEG on their head, so now we can monitor not just physiology, uh, but we can also be monitoring a brain function, and this illustrates here the broad constellation um, of outcome measures that you can integrate simultaneously uh, to truly get a comprehensive picture of what you're producing. Um, and we've also been working very hard on creating our own stimulators uh, that are capable of, of addressing a broad range of waveforms, and also um, uh, head ears. Uh, and in the process producing, um, I think, what, what is going to be very compelling data uh, that reinforces the notion um, that details matter. And so in this case, what you're looking at is a comparison of different waveforms from 25 hertz to 100 hertz to burst to a bilateral, both ears, 25 hertz, and contrasting an active versus a sham condition where in this case, sham is actually stimulating the earlobe. And under the concept that, that you want specificity in what you do, uh, we would predict that where you place the electrode on the ear, as long as how you energize it, will produce distinct outcomes. And, and the point here is not to show that one necessarily is better than another, but to show um, that de de these details matter, and that's actually a, a good thing, uh, because it supports the notion of specificity and target engagement, which ultimately supports um, specificity and outcome. And finally, I'm just uh, gonna conclude here 
uh, that we're, we're, we're also enthusiastic about incorporating sensing, uh, including sensing um, 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 on the ear itself. Um, and uh, um, thanks for your attention to this video.